so I'm so excited because I'm in Taos, New Mexico, a place that touched my heart so deeply and of the great joy of having you both on. Beautiful and powerful to hear your story. And I just want to open that to you. So either of you who feels called, just jumping in, tell us about yourselves. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning. Um, my name is Kona Maribel. I'm the middle child. Um, I am part of the Taos Pueblo um, community. I'm a youth advocate alongside of a student of life currently studying holistic healing, herbalism, um, and just I've dedicated to be of service to indigenous people, especially my people um, of this land. I'm super honored and excited to open up this conversation um, and just to be in this in this presence. Um, I can already feel that it's very strong and it's very loving and very powerful. Um, thank you so much, Samar, for inviting us and allowing us to be part of this. It's truly an honor. Um, yeah, and just, it's just good. I'm just happy to, to be here sitting next to my sister, Aspen. Thank you, Kona. Well, good evening and good afternoon, all those attending and good morning for the viewers watching this after <laughs> it's recorded. I'm Aspen. I am the eldest of three girls the Mirabal sisters. Our youngest sister is Masa and she's, I don't know where she is today. <laughs> she might be uh, finishing up at the farm where she's currently working. Um, I, like I said, I'm the oldest of three girls and I've set, set the standards pretty high as far as this is life. We have a purpose and whatever you go into, do it with full love, good intentions, and with, a, with an open heart, open mind. Um, I identify as a, a Northern New Mexico birth, indigenous birth keeper. I've been doing birth work as a full spectrum doula for two years now, and have been on the path to becoming a more versed and knowledgeable birth worker for the past 10 years. My journey started at 15 years old as I um, mentored with midwives of Northern New Mexico uh, for a summer. And after that, I spent most of my time traveling South America and most recently parts of Guatemala with a uh, traditional rural midwives. So yeah, it's just a blessing and an honor to be here and in the presence of all of these individuals. And of course, with you, Summer. Thank you, Aspen. Thank you both for just bringing your energy into the space and just the love and the heart that's so strong with you always. But one of the things I'm so struck with spending time with both of you is that the deep respect that you both walk with. And so when we chatted about this, you know, I sat with like, what do we name this? What do we call this? Because it's so many different things. And the words that came were young indigenous healers. And that might seem very trite, but I think each of those aspects are really important because the youth that you both have in body is in contrast to the dedication and the strength and the, the knowing that it's that you're holding in your bones. And I feel like that's really important because there's going to be all kinds of people on this call. There's going to be all kinds of people who listen to this call later uh, from all different backgrounds. And I guess the place I did, that would be beautiful to start is like, why so early? Why are so dedicated to your path at the ages that you're at? What's important about this to you? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> for me, the reason why so young whether it's good or bad, um, just being the next generation to carry on this, this earth work. Um, and then also being an advocate for the, the younger generation. I, it was really spoken to me that I needed to be an advocate. You know, I needed to, to really show up to, um, 
to the earth, to the world, but also to the younger, you know, people, because I didn't get to see um, indigenous native people normalized in society. And I want that to stop. I want that to end. I want to be the voice that tells people that they can be anything that they want to be. Um, I want to be the advocate to show people that um, we can break these stereotypes and that we are strong and resilient and that we can, um, you know, conquer the world. You know, we can, we can just be right alongside with any minority. Um, and then also the fact that, you know, in this day and age, unfortunately, time is going really quickly. It's constant move, move, move. And I sometimes, most of the majority of the time, I'm not going to lie, like I get sucked into that. Um, and it's, it's very scary, but I think that that was a, a, a reason, a main reason why I, I do the things that I do. But as a traditional indigenous um, woman <clears throat> who takes on the roles of wanting to be of service, uh, you know, what, what, do you, what do I have else to do but to constantly learn to be a student of life um, and to try to learn the best ways to, to help and heal people. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. I think for me, um, you know, I, when Kona was born here at home in the house that we're in right now, I was four years old and that was really the, the first birth that I attended in a very natural way. And it really set the tone for me. I mean, four years old, I, was there for the prenatal checkups and there's pictures. I don't remember, of course, maybe in my, my body, my muscle memory, I can remember what that felt like. But one thing that stuck with me was being asked to cut the umbilical cord of Kona after she was born. And we have ritual that is, some of it's long forgotten. Um, but primarily around the postpartum time, as soon as the baby is born, we have our, our placenta rituals. And my duty was to disconnect the organ that was giving her life um, so that it, it could be kept in the earth in another way, right? It, it goes back to the earth. And, and I think that duty was a huge responsibility for me. And then I was, um, all of that was forgotten. And I just carried on with my childhood until, like I said, 10 years ago, more or less, when I was 14, the intense desire, that calling to learn more about something absolutely unknown, midwifery, um, came into my conscience. And for those of you who are unaware of our indigenous roots, we are located in northern New Mexico. There are 19 pueblos in the in the state of New Mexico and Taos Pueblo is the most northern pueblo in, um, in New Mexico. And so in my area, there currently aren't any practicing uh, Pueblo, Taos Pueblo midwives, the closest Pueblo midwife that isn't from Taos Pueblo is in San Juan in the Española Valley. And slowly but surely we're seeing this resurgence of these, um, these proper ways being brought back and it's really great. And I don't know where it came from. Um, and I didn't know for a while until years passed and um, I discovered that our great aunt from Hamas Pueblo on our paternal side was a midwife for her community. And so I don't know why that's inspiring to me or why that brings me um, such passion and, and really brings out my, um, I don't know, I have no idea why, but it just feels right and good. And I know that if I, if I fight this calling, it will not lead me anywhere um, that is, a good place, I guess, you know, like staying on this path, keeping my focus has really kept me um, in the light and in the magic, in a very sacred space of having connection with ancestry and the current ancestors that bounce around with us, the magic, all of it. 
That's funny. I'm all watching you. Like, I'm like not a part of this interview. I'm like, wow. <laughs> Even though I've heard it like 40 times, like plus, like I'm like, dang, that's my sister. <laughs> it's amazing to hear that. I've heard that story and hearing it a second time. It's just like, it goes deeper and it goes deeper. And, you know, that brings us into this. And this, I know this is something so important for both of you is your roots and your identity and your indigenousity and what that means. And, you know, we've shared, had a lot of conversations while I've been here, which have been so fun for me just around my ancestry and, you know, being born in this modern world and having these very strong, like, backgrounds. And so just, like, opening what that means to you, because I think there's a huge gift in hearing that. Every time I listen to both of you or I listen to anyone rooted deeply in their culture, I learn something. And so whatever you feel is really important around being a young person and an indigenous person and specifically in your own role as a healer I think it would be such a gift to everybody to receive I think part of this work uh, birth work that I do specifically it does fall into the realm of, of being um, for me becoming an being an aspiring midwife or a midwife assistant and in the work that I've done, I've never um, thought about it in a way to make money. And I've met enough midwives that have a really difficult time making money um, because it's hard work. And a lot of indigenous people around the world have lost their healers, their um, spiritual leaders, those that really held the medicine and were able to provide that to their community members. And becoming a comadrona, partera, a midwife of any sort is in that same realm of healing people being there. You don't just turn it off, you know, it's, it's not something that you can completely walk into and walk out of. If you are really following this path and if you're so lucky to have a community that you're able to serve, stick to that. And for me, I don't see money signs with it because it's just, it's not right. And so I think for all of you that are able to attend this evening, something that I would want you to, to take away from hearing me speak is that um, we're really holding on as indigenous people. We're, we cannot remember too much about what's in the past or we can't revitalize too much because that's that's just not what it is that's not the reality in our Taos Pueblo ways nothing is written um there's no records we don't have a language that can even record it. so everything is auditory and passed down in story and if an elder dies with that story then it's then it's uh it that goes with closed it goes with them yeah. and so as indigenous people we're trying our best to to remember these ways but shift in a way that we're able to hold on to our roots and our practices our rituals as indigenous people while also maintaining a presence in western society and the expectations of that while also living in a in a system that has so much racism and um, there's a ton of biases and there's even this thought that indigenous people are completely gone mm -hmm. and living in, in Taos County, we're a tourist hub for sure. And it's always so heartbreaking to see the tourists come in to our village when it's open and not knowing the land that they're on, the, the beauty that surrounds them because maybe they're in their phones or only wanting it for a picture and really not paying respects to the people. And, and what, you know, like you go to Machu Picchu and, and it's like, oh, this is a dead civilization. Like, this is cute. And let's take some pictures. Let's like walk all over the ruins and then leave, right? There's no respect to that civilization that has been there. At least that's the norm. And so, our Pueblo, we're not a ruin, you know, that's so dis disrespectful. Anything that you see in, in museums that are considered artifacts, those have a place, you know, mm -hmm. and so 
bringing back um, midwifery is not going to be through the same lens as my great aunts in Hamas Pueblo. It's not going to be um, on the same it's not going to have the same flavor as 200 years ago because yeah. we're just not there anymore. We're trying to maintain that balance. And so just to recognize that indigenous people are still here and every day it's a struggle to um, hold on to our rituals because of, of the balance. You know, it's, it's yeah. easy and very romantic to say, I'm an indigenous person, I live off the land, but really it's like, where's that money coming from? How are you paying for that car? Like, do you even know um, where, where you're gonna get this or that? You know, it's, it's, it's really hard, especially when we're pushed out of our sacred lands. And then still like also like trying to maintain that balance of, of, being individual and unique. I mean, with my practice and like what I want to be and become and am, like I'm learning 100% that you have to live and breathe this. Like you can't just like go to an eight to five job and say like, okay, I'm leaving my work at home. You know, it's like, you have to create that balance as well, but you also have to like walk your talk. And that's something that I vow for 100% as like indigenous people, you know, it's like, we were put on this earth to be of service to this earth and to take care of this earth and to watch over this earth. I like, do your part, you know? And, and as I don't have a quite a label quite yet, just because there's so many things that I want to do and want to become. Um, so I just say of service to people, but you know, by doing that, you have to, you have to really remember that, um, you have to watch what you do, watch what you say, watch what you eat, like watch what you drink, um, you know, watch what you're praying for and manifesting. So like that, that balance that Aspen is saying is, is so true. Like, I don't know if anybody who's watching has felt that, but I feel like you can talk to any indigenous person and they can understand the, the struggle behind that because it's, it's, going out into the Western world, into the Western society and balancing that, and then coming back home into a traditional um, realm and knowing that that's where your like mind, body and soul wants to truly be. But like Aspen said, you know, that's not just, that's not the pace that we're going at. And so it is really difficult and it is really hard. So like for me, my biggest inspiration was where can I find that balance in my career? Where can I find that balance in, in the things that I really want to do and that will make me happy and, and know that I will make an impact for my people, for the next generation and for this earth, you know, that's, that's really, really important for me. Mm, thank you both. You know, so much you've said is so rich and, you know, in the last few days since, since we were last uh, hanging out, I've had a lot of, um, deep insights and almost cellular memory, you know, like so many things so similar to, to how it was with my grandmas on both sides, you know, and then also, I think, I think, you know, we've had conversations just around being of a generation where and you're talking about the, the tension, the tension between a traditional life way and having to survive in a world where there's a superimposition of money and, you know, um, regulatory bodies and all of these things and then how that can come in and and change the circular way in which energy moves and make it very linear and very disembodied and very disconnected and I think there's trauma and reasons why the world is like that but one of the things that I've been reflecting on the most and I just love to hear anything that comes up for both of you is is being between worlds you know like that's definitely been my path and I think a lot of people that are here in some way belong and don't belong or are searching for an earth connection or to be of service like the themes that both of you bring so strongly that and you said this word aspen or this slime that touched me so much if you're lucky enough to have a community and i think that's so beautiful because it's so true you know if you are lucky enough to have it it's it's there it's supportive what would you offer for people who feel the call to be of service and to tend but may not have that how can they respect indigenous communities while it's also being of service to the earth and to each other? Is there any anything that comes to you guys around that? I think what really comes to mind is um, 
number one, checking one's privilege. Mm. And we know that if you are a white person, that like really scales you up, you know, you, your, priv your privilege is high just because of your skin color. And in a lot of spaces, we don't wanna believe that, but that's just the truth. And you don't even have to log on to social media or watch the news or see newspapers. If you're in this line of work, you can already feel that. You can already see that and maybe you've, you've experienced it. And I think that's, that's the number one thing is checking your privilege and see where you fall in that. And there's this, um, this, in a lot of healing spaces, they can kind of be toxic where non-Indigenous people come in with this sense of entitlement and then they have this territorial nest over teachings that they've learned. And, and calling it their own though. And when they start branding it, making money off of Indigenous ways, um, that's, that's what I don't support and that's what I don't stand for. And an example would be um, something more or less recent that came into a lot of birth working community conversations was the usage of the rebozo from Mayan way, right, from Mexico. And that's essentially a shawl, um, a long, um, nice piece of secure um, woven tapestry of some sort that we in in our culture it's just a key it's just a wrap it's a veil of protection and we carry our babies with it sometimes we wrap our waists with it and sometimes it's used to wipe snotties off the kiddos you know and that exact or the the conversation that came up was that a lot of white people a lot of birth organizations um, such as like midwifery groups and doula groups, tons of Roboso working workshops um, were led by white people and they were not paying homage or respects to where the origin was of, of the practice. And Roboso and birth work is, it does wonders, it's amazing. And people were taking credit for that. And a lot of, um, indigenous people um, were left very much hurt and have been hurt, right? That's a common theme in indigenous oh, communities is, okay, when are people gonna stop taking our, our customs and our ways and making it, and just, I guess, honoring where its origin is. And so I think, you know, that ties into um, how you can be of service. I think being of service means that you're, you've really checked yourself. You know what's triggering for you. You know your traumas and you've worked through them. Um, there's a huge following of um, individuals that seek out the medicine way, right? Whether that's NAC, that's the, the peyote culture in Central and North America, whether that's ayahuasca, whether that's the cactus plants, whether those are it's the vines or the roots, um, people are indulging in these practices and they're paying money or they're charging people. And that is not the right way. And so if you are of privilege to attend these ceremonies, make sure that you check, check them right? Check the organization and make sure if you are paying that it is going to a good cause. Um, indigenous people, we don't, we never believed in money. That exchange does not make sense. Currency of that sort does not make sense, but now it does in, in our societies because it's a means of survival and indigenous people, we've been surviving for a really long time. And so we gladly accept, but when it comes to white people charging for indigenous practices, that's not good. So if you're in service to others and you have a good practice charging, um, maybe second guess that, right? Having discounts, having scholarships for BIPOC, black and indigenous people of color, um, 
those that are underprivileged and in are in rural communities or don't typically have access to good health care, good foods, good water. Um, it's okay to just give it back to the, wherever you are, because most likely wherever you're watching, you're on native land. So recognize the names, learn the name and, and pay respects to the earth and, and where, where you are. Um, it's a hard one though, because a lot of people come with good intention. Um, and then they get sucked into the negativity most of the time. Yeah, but I think that you worded it really, really well on like, I huh? I tried. <laughs> no, you did. You like, if I was listening in, like that would make sense. But I also know like on the other side of the spectrum, easier said than done. You know, it's like a lot of white people's mindsets and, and other people's mindsets is like me, me, me. I want this um, and I want this now. And I don't want to do the work, but it's like, if you're going into these rural communities, I, I've mentioned this before to become allies, you know, become allies with the, the communities that, um, cause majority of the time they're not going to see you as allies. You know, they're going to see you as like, Oh, another person, um, another white person. And so a lot of the times there's people that have just come and go and come and go. And so like, we've created a pattern of like, oh, that person isn't gonna stay long, especially in the, the health world um, community. Um, there's a lot of people who just say like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm here for six months and then they, they move on. So like, if you're creating an ally um, alliance, if you're creating a really amazing, strong bond with the people, whether you're, you're white or African-American or another indigenous native fellow person, you want to create that. And then therefore a community will slowly create and, and begin to happen. But you can't just go into a community and say, and yeah, and claim it and say like, oh, um, I want to go in your house right away. Like, I don't want to work for it. Or like Aspen saying in the medicine world, you know, you can't just expect to be handed these certain things, you know, you, you really have to work for it. It's a sacrifice. You have to learn indulge, like being in like, um, what is the word indulgence? Um, you have to be truly abundant, constantly giving and receiving. Um, and you have to just respect that a lot of the times the medicine is just you sitting there, you know, you, you just completely meditating with it. A lot of people think, oh, I have to take this medicine in order to tap into my higher self or my creation or my third eye. When in actuality, the way that you do that is by being sober, is by being truly sitting with your, yourself. And then once the, the medicine people, if they really know, they'll see that. And once they see that, then they say that you're ready. But make sure that you're going into a organization that gives back to, um, you know, the less fortunate. And just because, you know, unfortunately, like the, the color of your skin is going to say a lot. Um, you know, you can try and try and try, but there's always going to be that, that stigma. Um, but also just really checking your facts, you know, doing a lot of research, reading, um, meditating on it, really constantly sitting with it. And like, please follow your gut. If you think that something doesn't feel right, or if there's a ceremony going on, or if there's like, an, like for an example, metaphorically or literal, you, go, you don't feel like going down that alley because it feels a little sketch, like follow your gut because it's always going to be right. And there's always going to be a next opportunity. Um, majority of the time when your gut says no, you know, I don't think that this is right. A um, couple weeks, a couple months later, you're going to, you know, something's going to pop up and you're going to be like, oh, I'm glad I didn't do that. And look who I found. I found an incredible family that has welcomed me in. And then therefore somewhat a community, right? <laughs> but I think that is a really um, interesting topic because I, I also have to watch what I, what I say. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you both. I mean, it's so rich and, you know, it touches on, on wounding on every side, right? Like 
there's so many layers to this conversation and and I was I wish I'd made some notes actually because I was like ping 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 I want to like talk about this I want to talk about this um but the first thing I just want to acknowledge is your generosity for even being here and opening up what you've experienced not just in your generation but in the gen precede you and what I was really struck by was even 10 years as a global community we didn't really have the vernacular or the consciousness or the awareness or the understanding and you know like it's been really fun being here this month and just like looking at the different generations like I turned 40 and you guys are almost half my age but just like look remembering myself at your age right and going like that just wasn't things that were talked about this level of consciousness and awareness and so so many, and I'm going to use the Arvigo Institute as an example. So I made some videos last week. Some of you might have seen them. I've been a little bit quiet about the transition because there were so many layers. But one of the things, you know, especially since our first conversation, Aspen, you and I, when you spoke about charging, I had to really sit with the truth of your lived experience and then the truth of all the like beautiful massage therapists who just want to help women get pregnant and need to put a roof over their heads and the space in between. And so part of it is those are communities that aren't indigenous helping people that aren't indigenous and currency and money seems to be the language there. But what I'm hearing is an invitation to it again, strongly acknowledge where everything comes from. And that's part of, I think why we're here is like, how do we make this work really work for the roots that it came from and not just our Vigo, but everything. How do we change the culture around this? And you guys have offered some really potent gifts around that and respect again is the word that's coming up really strongly for me. So I guess before we go into questions, is there something else either of you or both of you really, really want to share before we open it up to a collaborative discussion? I think just real quick, um, uh, if any of you have your own practice, really see if you have any indigenous people <laughs> as regulars, um, how many people of color just in general that you've served. Because if it's only white people, then that's really saying something that could be your branding, that could be the tone of your voice, the presence and how you carry yourself. And my demographic that I would ideally love to be serving is just my my Taos Pueblo community. And something that ties into that concept is um, when it comes to spirituality and um, rituals and, and practices that are deeply rooted and that have age to them, um, indigenous people have this ability to connect with the elements. That's just our duty, that's our purpose and why we are still in existence to, to be these speakers, to be these representatives of, of the land. <clears throat> we're the OG um, activists, essentially, even if we're not doing frontline work, activist work, we're, we're still constantly. fighting for our lands because any little slip up, we'll lose that. So allow indigenous people to keep those practices and help them to make sure that they're able to maintain those practices in a good way and in a way where it's them training each other and less um, of non-natives or non-indigenous people taking those roles because what that's doing is it's taking the native healers and native practitioners out of practice it's taking us yeah. out of our um, <coughs> ability to heal our own people because here we are teaching others and they're going out to the cities where yes, it's knowledge, it's a gift for the entire world, but for those in the most vulnerable state, um, making sure that you're allowing them to really be supported and held. And so there's a way of doing that, you know? And like I mentioned, charging and, and money and all of that, we're having to survive as indigenous people and often we are not solely able, and most of you could probably relate to this, can't just give your services for free, can't offer them for free, because how are you going to support your children? 
and support the tiny environment that you've cultivated for yourself, for your well being. So I don't know. That's just what I wanted to tag on to what I mentioned last. But I, mean, I also, sorry, go ahead, Kona. Go ahead. No, I just want to highlight the fact that Aspen said, like, take a take a step back you know and look at your facilities look at your practices look at your whatever career that you're in and really looking at those those race you know those minorities like look at those around you and and really see like what you're doing because majority of the time we just don't feel like we're being seen we don't feel like we're being heard we don't feel like our message is getting across the nation, the world, um, when it needs to be, when it should be. You know, we should be the first ones to be speaking, especially on native land, um, indigenous land. And as a youth advocate, I want to see a better tomorrow, meaning I want non-indigenous people to, to start hearing us. I want non-Indigenous people to start listening to us and asking educated questions, but also like watching what you're saying to us. You know, no, we don't live in teepees anymore. No, we don't like, it's still bad to wear a headdress if it, you know, like if that's just not your culture. It's like all of these stereotypes, I wanna see a better tomorrow of just educated people understanding that these questions and these comments and these stereotypes are not okay. And we are trying already so much to take care of ourselves, take care of our families, break generational traumas, break our own traumas, break our own patterns, take care of literally the land that we're standing on and more. And we're still trying to find a good balance with the Western world and the traditional world. And on top of that, like still trying to find a profession that will help our people help our community as well as still be coming financially stable because like we keep on saying that's just the world that we live in um and so with all of those things in mind just like sit with that and be an advocate to saying you know who are my neighbors and um if they're you know bipoc like how can i listen to them how can i support them you know, even if it means buying them a coffee, you know, like buying them like stainless straws, it doesn't have to always be what you think it might. It can just literally giving a helping hand um, because we're just, we're, we're on the same planet. We're on the same earth. I don't understand why this has to be a conversation where uh, racism and stereotyping and all of these negative aspects that we have to constantly live with is still still an issue in 2021, but unfortunately it is. And it's my job to, to try to be an advocate to, to stop that. So um, go ahead, Smart. <laughs> I'll just stop there for well, now. I'm just vigorously agreeing with you. Um, <laughs> what, what's like really landed in my heart, you know, is just that the way forward that's in harmony is for everyone. You know, wherever there's reparation, wherever there's, healing it's like everybody's going to get the healing if they actually start to walk the way that's in resonance and that would be taking care of those who need the care and that would be taking care of the land you know because and you both know this but i think most of the people on this call who've been on these calls know like for me my biggest concern right now is the climate crisis like for sure like i'm not hiding from the fact that we are in that and so the preciousness of any indigenous wisdom anywhere in the world but also of any helping hand anywhere in the world who wants to do good. It's like just getting people around the table, having these conversations I think is so necessary because then it gets everyone into alignment. So I just thank you both so much for your willingness to speak to the world as you, as you experience it. And Kona, yeah. you said something about trauma. And I think that maybe we'll go into questions and I'll just first one. No, I've been fascinated listening to you about what you said something about healing ancestral trauma through healing your own trauma. Would you speak to that a little bit? Um, yeah, uh, I just, you know, being it being personal, 
but also it being the more and more that I'm getting educated, the more and more that I'm realizing that it isn't just me, it's everybody. It's your siblings, it's your parents, it's your grandparents. And majority of the time as uh, colored people, we have just been suppressed to burying that under the rug and never bringing it out. You know, don't talk about it with your kids, your grandkids, but in the end, um, it's going to come out and it's going to be like uh, boiling hot water and it's just going to scream at you until you figure it out. And so for me, um, me being so young, of course, I still have a long way to go until I until I'm blessed with having kids. But every day and every move that I make is for the next generation. And when I say next generation, I say my generation, my own um you know, offsprings and, and as well as my community. Um, and I don't want them to be the ones to have to, to do the work, you know, when I could have done the work when, if I had those resources and I had that knowledge to do so, then why didn't I do it? And so I want to be, um, a good ancestor. I love that saying of being a good ancestor because everything that you're doing day to day is going to affect and affect the nation, affect your lineage in a hundred years. And so by, by breaking the generational traumas while you're cleaning up your own traumas, it's, it's same, it's the same, but different, you know, it's literally the same thing. Um, but it's just more personal if you're working with your own traumas that in the end is just, is just generational trauma that just hasn't been cleaned up. I hope that kind of answers your question. Um, oh, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. It's beautiful. And when you were speaking, what was really clear is like, you're speaking from the perspective. I don't want to assume that, but from hearing you both over time is of the, the traumas of people who've had their lands taken away and of people who've been colonized. And I think that same medicine can apply to any of us. It's like we're dealing with different ones of us on different spectrums of our ancestry and our own work cleans it all up and essentially it's an invitation for all, all of us to clean and so thank you so i'd love to open this to questions if you guys are ready mm -hmm. so anyone that feels like they have a question or anything they'd love to say you're so welcome <laughs> You're muted. Oh yeah, whoever's talking is muted. Sorry, I was busy muting people. <laughs> oh, there I am. Hi, hi Aspen and Kona. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> it's very interesting. I've actually been in your home. I know your dad, worked for your dad for the Christmas Pueblo in Santa Fe many years ago and uh, saw you as little girls and so it's and here you are all grown up and sharing your passion with the world. Uh, I'm an Arvigo practitioner and uh, my, uh, my wife uh, Bella who's also on the conversation as an Arvigo practitioner and midwife. So um, I think one of the things I'd like to know is um, you know what can we do to help you, I think, you know, everything you're talking about, you know, all racism and sexism and all the isms are based off of ignorance. And, um, and the most important thing, you know, even I think is the, the root of doctors really teacher, and I'm also a Chinese medicine practitioner. So again, I'm, I'm borrowing from another culture. Um, so I'm just wondering what, what can we do to, to help you uh, spread the education and, uh, and help pe open people's minds. And I mean, there's so many people now doing, uh, you know, sweat lodges and uh, uh, sun dances and moon dances. There's, there's so much going on in the world right now. I, I live in a community, I live in Palm Beach County now. And as you were talking, there's actually a tree here. It's, it's the um, tree of tears. Because here in Florida, you know, it's the end of the trail of tears and the, the tree here is the, 
the tree of of tears and so i don't know i'm i'm, I'm really moved i just saw it like last week for the first time and so it, it just i don't know what it just bring it stirs something within me you know this the connection to santa Fe and the, and of course taos taos was one of the only uh indigenous people who was not defeated by the spanish there's a tremendous story about you know the taos people and and the buildings taking on the uh the cannons you know and sustaining all the cannon fire from the spanish and so you you guys are still there standing and um, a strong force uh, in the indigenous community and uh, in the Southwest and now in the healing community. So how can we support you? Thank you. Thank you. Um, just really quickly, I think to answer your question in a, in a quick little statement, if I can, um, like I said, is just being an advocate. If you're especially older um, and, and you're watching the youth grow up, you know, making sure that you're having, I don't, it's not charity per se, but being a mentor, you know, being a voice for the ones that don't have voices, um, asking if they need help, you know, if there's indigenous BIPOC people in your community, uh, majority of the time, there's going to be um, an organization that always needs an extra set of hands, even during COVID. Um, and so for me, making it like a better tomorrow, I, for me, I'd like to see, you know, people being generous and doing generous acts without having to tell anybody, you know, like, I see so many times people video recording, feeding a homeless person or saying like, oh, I did this. Like, how many likes can I get? It doesn't matter. You know, like, I don't care about that. Social media is a tool and it always is going to be a tool. There's nothing real about social media. And so how can you use your social media platform in a way of spreading the word, spreading the voice, you know, doing the things that you need to do? Um, not only is it good, you know, you're, you said that you're a practitioner for uh, traditional Chinese medicine, so you know about the, the balances of the yin and yang and then the being zen, you know, it's like you really need to implement that into humanity. Um, for some reason, what's coming to me is just being, doing acts, selfless acts, because you want to, not because you feel like you have to. Um, because the, the majority of the, the highest rate of homeless people or people incarcerated are BIPOC people. And so it's like, we have to really show up to that and be a voice. So I can talk more and more, but that's kind of what I wanna, what I would wanna see. Is there, is there a group or organization? Um, I, you know, I kind of checked out your, when the, when the email went out, I checked out your Instagrams. I see you both are involved with quite a few um, organizations. And, um, and I was just wondering if there's, if there's any organization uh, that we can look for, for to educate ourselves or to help support. Yeah, I think for me, um... I'm an Indigenous midwife assistant, but I was just presented with a, an opportunity to start my apprenticeship as a student midwife. And that means quitting my full-time job and moving from Taos down south and, and, and really being fully committed to this organization, to becoming a licensed midwife so that I can bring that practice back to Taos Pueblo. And, um, so you could support me in my journey. You could support the organization, which is Changing Women Initiative. And they are a all indigenous um, group of birth workers and midwives and advocates for indigenous communities that have um, created a space to now mentor um, doulas and aspiring midwives in their journey. They have a prenatal clinic that they, um, that they have free to the indigenous surrounding indigenous communities. And they're also providing home birth services, which is 
pretty unique and rare to all of the New Mexico and Navajo Nation um, communities. So that's Changing Women Initiative. And then there is um, Tao Women United, and I'm a contracted full spectrum doula with this organization based out of um, Española Valley. And that's a really great resource as far as educating yourself on um, land issues, um, issues that make it to, to the um, like higher places in government that influence, um, well, you just had like a long New Mexico, um, a lot of nice um, bills change and come into Yay. effect, which is really great. It supports um, people in our line of work. But also, um, yeah, and then there's Tiwa Babies. That I'm a home visitor, so Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 or eight, uh, 40 hours a week, I'm a home visitor doing um, virtual services. And so that's based out of Taos Pueblo, my community up the road, and we serve all of Taos County. So those are the three main organizations that I can think of um, that would directly support um, me but as well as many aspiring indigenous birth workers and healers. Yeah. And then also something that popped up um, is an organization that I'm a part of, uh, Earth Guardians. Um, I'm a part of the, the creation of a annual indigenous youth training where every year for the, going on three years now, um, we bring, indigenous youth to a specific area. Unfortunately, last year was on Zoom. Nonetheless, it was really beautiful and really great. Um, but you can go ahead and just go to earthguardians.org um, and it's right there. You can see indigenous youth training and um, we do accept donations. Um, a lot of the time, uh, they have a lot of educational videos, a lot of educational things on how to become a better um, earth advocate as well as indigenous advocate. Um, and so it's just really great to, to be a part of that because I do feel like that is making a, a change and a great impact because we teach um, self-defense, uh, first aid on frontline working, um, traditional cooking, culture, um, singing, songwriting, uh, poetry, the list goes on and on and on and on. Um, but we can also, like Aspen said, by supporting her, you can also go ahead and support me because everything that is donated to me, whether it's um, uh, health stuff, uh, funds, um, it's, it's going back to my community as much as I can. Right now we're in my herb room, so everything that I do for the community is is done right here. And um, I'm hoping to eventually get more sustained, more bigger to the point where I can do this annually. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. If, unless Keith, you wanna add something. I just, um, thank you. You're Thanks. welcome. Thanks. It's cool to to meet you and know that you knew us back when and our dad. It's good good work that you and your wife are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. You too. Proud of you. Oh, Thanks. thank you. So I just sweet. wanted. To, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say something specifically. Um, hey, Kona. <laughs> um, Hey, Ashman. So um, <laughs> one of the things that I think is extremely important is when they were talking about the white privilege and how you can assist them. And aside from the wonderful resources that they've given you, um, they just like everybody else um, has like a Venmo account. And I think that's another way that you can contribute um, to their uh, their way of giving back to their community and helping out all these other communities is to Venmo them a uh, donation, which um, I try to do as much as possible because what they do is absolutely amazing. And they're like my teachers, even though as uh, the presenter was saying, they're half my age nonetheless. Um, it's a way to give back. And if you have the privilege to do so, I highly encourage that. So 
I will leave that up to them to put down their Venmo accounts, but I just wanted to shout them out because um, just like anyone, I think it's important to give back. And here we have two incredibly gifted indigenous women that also are not gonna ask you for money, but I will. The video yeah. in the email, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen, because uh, yeah, you're so right. Like, I'm not going to ask, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to slyly, but it's still really difficult for me to, to say that. But literally everything that is in my college <laughs> funds right now is going back to as much as I can to, to the community, to the youth. And that's what I want to do. No one's asking me to do that, you know, like, I feel in my mind, body, and soul that this is literally what I need to do and what I love to do. Like, I love, I just love it so much. <laughs> like, it's literally my passion. It's the definition of passion. It's, um, it's just what I've, what I've surrendered myself to, and I'm happy that I did. Maybe we have time for one more question, because the Venmo was an awesome comment. Thank you, Kristen. Um, so maybe last question, if anyone has that in their heart, and then we'll close. And also, like, if it's not on a monetary level, um, mm -hmm. I think branding is really important. Um, so like web design, I've been trying to get, find an Indigenous person that I can support, but now with the idea of like, Okay, I'm gonna be a student midwife here soon. Um, I gotta hold on to my funds to be able to to live away from home again. Um, so web design type things, um, donation of books like current textbooks that um, are are needed because she's gonna continue her education. And I know that uh, if there's any midwives, I know. Um, uh, I, I didn't get your name, but the doctor who asked us questions, his wife is a midwife, you know, all of these things are, um, that can feed and support our education, um, yeah. is great. And even like methods of self-care, you know, like if you want to send us stuff, that's great. And if you want us to like extend our, that donation or extend, whatever you're sending, we will gladly do that because everything that we do is reciprocal and goes right back into our community of Tuscaloosa and each other because we love to collaborate. But I also, yeah, yeah, your girl's on a college budget right now, guys. <laughs> like that's just the truth. But um, I love trading and I love, you know, like Aspen said, what did you say? Non, non monetary, not is that money? Yeah, yeah non monetary um, things like um, towels and, and self-care stuff and sheets, um, bed sheets, like for, for Aspen's birth work, pillow sheets, you know, like different things like that. We can create a list, um, because majority of the time we, we need a large abundance of, of those things. And even if you have indigenous artifacts that for some reason you, you feel awkward having them, yeah. you can, we can give it back to the Someone just laughed. <laughs> My dad's listening. I'm very inspired. What I might do is make a page on the website specifically for the both of you. Because it costs nothing for that to happen. And so obviously, like, I mean, I don't want to take too long with this, but whenever we make profit, like there's a percentage that'll go to Maya charities because of the origins of some of the techniques of this work. And then there's a percentage that'll go to Rosita because of her life that she gave to this. And you know, as I've been here, it's like wherever there, wherever we teach, there'll be a percentage that goes to the indigenous people there. But you guys are so generous with your, with your heart-based like opening here that I can just stick all this on the website. So it's a continuous place that if people feel in their hearts, they want to help a real person, you can just direct them to there. And we'll, we'll organize that between us tomorrow. Does that help a little bit? Okay, great. <laughs> a lot of it. <laughs> okay, last question. Is it floating? Okay, maybe it's not. Cool. Okay, I'm going to hand it back to the both of you to close however you feel is right in your heart to close. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, everyone. Okay.
And those of you who have already donated through PayPal or Venmo, we're, um, we are going to split the funds <laughs> and um, we're so grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. It was such a fun, blessed and honored um, evening and event. And I, I just love being a part of it. Thank you, everyone who took the time to be with us today. So we're going to close with a, a healing song. And uh, Samar, if you wouldn't record this portion. <laughs> so you all are in a, who are watching.